All right. So hello, everybody. Welcome back from your break. I hope you hydrated and feel refreshed so that we can talk about some occulted active regions. I want to take a moment to say hello to some of my former mentors who are out there today. I'm, I'm happy to see you in the, in the Zoom box and uh, to a bunch of old friends. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking on behalf of subgroup three. Our mission statement is to discover everything there is to know about occulted active regions um, and understand the overlap between this group and the other groups, uh, which we are in the somewhat peculiar position of giving this talk um, in advance of some of the other talks, which is a bit betraying to the other subjects because uh, we, we have a lot to learn about occulted active regions based on what we can learn from unocculted active regions or uh, spectroscopic observations. And so I'm going to be giving a very brief overview talk about occulted active regions, um, some of which have already been mentioned in the previous group. Uh, some of those talks were very exciting to me. Uh, and so I'm speaking on behalf of Mahmoud and myself, and here we go. Um, so one of the great magics of astronomy is eclipses. And I really love in Josh Wynn's chapter in the Exoplanets textbook, uh, there's a little introduction where he quotes Henry Norris Russell, who said, there are many ways of approach to unknown territory, which leads surprisingly far and repay their followers richly. And there is probably no better example of this than eclipses of heavenly bodies. And that just resonates with me to my core. I love the idea that eclipses are the Rosetta Stones that allow us to figure out from eclipsing binaries, we can figure out uh, masses and radii of stars from eclipses of active regions, we can figure out properties of those active regions. And I'm going to very, very briefly summarize some of those things and what we have found in some observations. Uh, going forward in the rest of this talk, I'm going to use the abbreviation AR to represent active regions because we could be talking about dark star spots or we could be talking about bright facular regions. Uh, both need to be studied in a similar way uh, from, from opposite contrast perspectives. And so when we study occultations of active regions, what we wish we could measure is often the physical dimensions of the active region. Uh, we wish we could know, for example, the radius of a spot and its penumbral and umbral radii. We wish we could know the precise, precise positions on the star in stellar coordinates of where the active region resides. And we wish we could know the total spot coverage or the total number of spots on the star at a time. In reality, what we can measure more often is the active region radius and contrast. These two quantities are often degenerate as we saw in Maria's talk earlier. Uh, we often measure the active region positions, but they are relative to the transit cord and our understanding of the position of the transit cord on the stellar surface has to come from auxiliary observations like Rossiter and McLaughlin observations. And so we really depend on those additional observations to get us the answer. And then uh, the number of active regions in the transit cord is accessible as Maria showed, but uh, it's quite difficult to know for certain what the total spot coverage is on the star because we're only occulting a small region of it. And so uh, just to depict this graphically, uh, I am a tremendous fan of HAP-P11, and there will be a slight bias towards HAP-P11 in this talk. Uh, and here is, here's the first uh, glimpse of my bias, which is that on New Year's Eve of 2009, there was this incredible eclipse of the host star HAP-P11 by its hot Neptune or warm Neptune-sized uh, planet the planet transits from near the south pole to near the north pole of its star as depicted by the region with the dashed lines on the right. And so it moves from left to right across that transit cord and it revealed to us during the transit event two spot occultations which are the peaks in the light curve on the left. They are peaks because less light is missing when a spot is occulted by the planet than when the spot is occulting a brighter region of the star. Uh, if we had observed facular occultations, we might see the opposite. We would see negative dips. Uh, 
And you can see on the right, there are clouds of spot locations and radii on the right-hand panel which represent the uncertainty, the posterior distribution for the radius and position of the spots is reflected by these draws from the posterior distributions there. And so you can see we're, we're fairly confident that the larger spot occultation is coming from a large spot that is fully occult or that fully engulfs the planet at one point during its transit. Whereas the smaller spot uh, at around mid transit could be a quite small spot compared to the larger spot uh, sitting exactly in the middle of the transit cord, or it could be a larger spot that is being grazed by the planet as it occults. And so uh, there's a radius position degeneracy here uh, without even accounting for the fact that there's also a contrast radius degeneracy, which we were not fitting for in this plot. But the, the joy of studying spot occultations is that you get to break a lot of degeneracies. So when it comes to studying unocculted active regions, uh, as, as you could infer from some of the earlier talks, it's actually not obvious when you're looking at facular dominated or spot dominated uh, rotational modulation of stars. It requires careful inference to figure that out, whereas when you have these spot quotations, it's relatively clear what is a positive bump and what is a negative bump in your transit light curve. And so I just want to take a brief detour through some historical references that uh, if, you're, if you're getting started in this field are worth taking a look at. Uh, and I'm going to admit up front that the bias here is not towards completion, but is biased towards references from 2011, because 2011 was a spectacular year for spot occultations. So in 2011, Corot 2 uh, had some published light curves that are really remarkable because you can see that the spot occultations started just after ingress. And then as subsequent transits were observed, more and more spot occultations were observed later and later throughout the transit phase, which could be interpreted as stellar rotation beneath the planet's transit cord. Uh, so Corot was, was doing this way back when it started being cool, as was Kepler. And we've heard a lot about Kepler-17. Here is my slight nod to Kepler-17. One of the difficulties in studying occulted active regions is trying to figure out where to place the red line on the leftmost plot in this slide. The leftmost plot shows the transit light curve with the residual signal superimposed on top that we observed from Kepler in black, deciding how low that transit uh, line ought to go determines how much you would interpret uh, facular crossings or bright region crossings and exactly how much you would interpret as spot occultations. And so this uh, degeneracy in, in interpretation between a slightly deeper transit or a slightly shallower transit and more spot occultations or more faculty occultations is one of the difficulties that we have to contend with when we study spot occultations. Then comes uh, my bias, my HAT P11, which uh, was kind of cracked open by Roberto Sanchez Ojeda and Josh Wynn in 2011 as well. They published this really beautiful paper where they studied the spot occultations of HAP-P11 uh, as observed by the Kepler Space Telescope and tried to do a joint analysis where they studied the rossiter McLaughlin observations taken from ground-based telescopes and tried to interpret the potential spin orbit angle of the planet, uh, planet's orbit relative to the star's spin axis. And what they found is that the there are two solutions to the roster McLaughlin observations. And these two solutions can also be represented by a, a single or a pair of active latitudes on the star, depending on whether or not you're staring at the pole, you might be looking at one active region that is, uh, sorry, one active latitude that is near the pole. Or if you're looking near the equator, then you would be seeing these two active latitudes in a slice across the star. And so there was some really neat uh, inference going on in this paper, trying to deduce which of these two is the most likely. Uh, 
scenario. And so this, I think, uh, for me was so exciting because it showed that the star spots themselves can yield physical parameters about the system that might be interesting for other reasons, like whether or not the orbit of this planet is aligned with the host star's spin, uh, which it appears not to be in both of these cases. And then it would be remiss of us to mention that you can do this kind of detailed spot occultation modeling without also mentioning that you can do measurements out of transit. And when you're measuring the flux of the star out of transit, you get rotational modulation, which shows a peak to trough variability of the star that is often quite difficult to interpret. Uh, there have been a number of papers out on this in the last two years, and they often show that your interpretation of how spotted a star is, what the contrast of those spots might be, and um, the number of spots are highly degenerate with your interpretation of the stellar inclination and the contrast of the spots, for example. And so care needs to be taken to try to treat the system holistically and to study both the rotational modulation and the spot occultations observed in transit simultaneously so that you can infer global properties about the stellar surface uh, given the biased but precise view of the transit cord that we get during a transit, uh, as well as the global precise measurement of the lighter and darker hemispheres of the star. So combining those is, is really challenging, but there's a lot of great science to be done when you do. We wanted to give a quick shout out to the wealth of star spot codes that are out there. Uh, Mahmoud and I realized when we compiled this list that there was no way we could be perfectly complete. And so we tried to put citations into the papers that have code available online or probably did at some point. Uh, and so if your code is missing, we'd be happy to add it to this slide if you message me on Slack, for instance. Uh, I'd be happy to add in anything for posterity. Uh, but the, the, the moral of this slide for me is that there are a wealth of codes that we can compare against one another and try to identify which models are sufficient. Uh, in other words, what is a sufficient level of complexity to model the spot occultations that we actually observe photometrically and spectroscopically. So let's move into the effects of occulted active regions on transmission spectroscopy. I'm going to briefly mention a paper or two that have done this uh, that I find really exciting. A very famous one would be HT189733 b, which was observed by Stis on Hubble by Singh et al. in 2011, my favorite year today. Uh, and in this paper, they studied what the depth correction uh, as measured by the transit light curve ought to be based on the inferred out of transit uh, spot coverage and spot properties. And so this shows the degeneracy between uh, the interpretation of the planet's atmospheric properties and the stellar spot properties or the active region properties, which can also be shown here. This is a, a single visit of Hubble Space Telescope observations where each color is a different wavelength showing what seems to be a quite complex spot occultation like feature that is chromatic. And given the chromaticity, you can try to identify what the spot temperature is uh, as well as determining given the spot temperature, how big must the spot be to produce the amplitude feature we see here and an amplitude feature that we see in out of transit observations of HD189. And Mahmoud put together a few observations from STIS and from ACS and from Spitzer and showed that for HD189, you can infer a scattering slope at small wavelengths, for example, that could be explained by a model that simply has stellar heterogeneity, uh, stellar surface heterogeneity. 
uh, Nestor has done this as well. I wanted to give a great shout out to the Access team and their work on the system WASP-19, which is kind of doing everything that we've advertised uh, in real life right now with real data. And so here are some Magellan IMAX observations of WASP-19, which seem to show both a dark spot in the first transit here in blue, and then a bright spot being occulted in the transit shown in red uh, in the same system. And so this kind of represents the complexity of real stars, the complexity of stars that we know we need to model in order to understand the atmospheres of real planets. And on the right, you can see some of the uh, spot contrasts that they infer and what the temperature ought to be of the active region. And uh, in my last shout out to a historical reference, uh, there's a really cool paper by Shechan et al, uh, which shows Izanya Observatory observations of HAPI-11 as well, which combines these long-term photometric observations in the R band pass in order to infer what the spot coverage of HAPI-11 has been over decades. And that allows you to compare observations that were taken with WIFC-3, STIS at two wavelengths, Spitzer in channel one and channel two, and put them all together on the same scale which is kind of one of the, uh, I think, ambassadors to what our, our challenge is. We need to be able to combine the observations that have been taken with space telescopes in the past with the upcoming observations that are coming in the near and more distant future. And in order to do that, we need some observations that we can use as a baseline in order to compare was the star more or less active during this observation than compared with the with C3 observations, for example. And you can see that in this work, the inference of the uh, scattering slope towards the blue is dependent upon whether or not you account for the spot correction, uh, where here the spot correction is being applied on the black data points and not being applied on the gray data points, which show a slightly uh, deeper transit at shorter wavelengths. So I want to shout out a few open questions that we are talking about actively in SG3. Some of those include, for example, what additional observations would allow us to constrain the properties of active regions that are or are not occulted? Um, we know that regions that are active can be unocculted in one transit and then unoccult, uh, sorry, and then occulted in the next transit. And so getting constraints on the unocculted active regions will help us constrain the in-transit occulted active regions as well. And so what other observations can we take that would allow some crosstalk between these two camps of spots and faculty? Further, it would be really cool if we could get spectroscopic models from the kind of ab initio simulations that Mayuk was doing in his talk earlier. Uh, and then compare those synthetic spectra to kind of the state of the art in this field, which is often to use stellar spectral templates of different effective temperatures in order to stand in for the active region spectra. How, how good is, is the state of the art is one of the questions that our group wants to try to answer. Is it good enough? And then, of course, there's always a resolution uh, point of view worth talking about, which I know Drake Deming will talk about later on, which is how do our relatively high signal to noise observations in, say, the Kepler bandpass uh, lead to inferences that might be biased or uh, inadequate when it comes to the lower signal to noise retrievals of narrow wavelength features. It would be really great if we could make some deductions in broadband passes and then use them to project into narrowband passes what ought to be happening. And so I want to leave you with some thoughts. Uh, and these thoughts are in the form of a flow chart. I'm calling this the occulted active regions, the game. And suppose that you've found a spotless star. <laughs> 
if you've done that, I would like to congratulate you because I don't know that you can do that. But if you haven't found a spotless star, then you're going to need to do something more complex than proceeding directly to studying its planets. If you've not found a spotless star, we can then ask, have you measured the spot properties well? And of course you would say, well, how, how would you define well? That's, that's kind of a challenge. But I would contend that no matter what your answer is to this question, the next question is, are there active region occultations observed in transit? If you have observed active region occultations, then you can try to use those active region occultations to infer properties of the spot. If there have not been active region occultations, then you need to try to make the best of the unocculted active regions coming from other observations. If there were active regions observed in occultation, then you would hopefully be able to compile your ignorance of that spot's properties and propagate that into uncertainty on the transmission spectrum of the planet that you're trying to measure. Similarly, if you did not have active regions uh, observed in transit that were occulted, then you would try your best to use unocculted active regions and evidence of them, which may be spectroscopic or photometric, and use that to estimate the impact of active regions that may be occulted that you did not detect in transit and see how that could affect your transmission spectrum. So all together, uh, we have the game to play. And this game is going to be mapped out a bit by the upcoming talks. Uh, I'm going to conclude just a, a sliver early so that we can have just a moment for discussion or jump into the next talk if there are no questions. But our next talks are aligned on this slide with the point that they are most relevant to. So we're going to hear about how many uh, stars that host hot Jupiters are variable. We're going to hear about using a variety of observations that could be considered observations of unocculted active regions in order to infer the effect of the active regions on transmission spectroscopy. And of course, there will be a talk when we talk specifically about star spot crossings with James Webb. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you very much, Fred. This is great. And I love this game. I, I'd love to play it as well. Um, so we do have some questions from Slido. Uh, Oscar Steiner is asking, um, it says a combination of light curve measurements with Doppler shift measurements could potentially entangle the fraction of spot to faculty coverage. Yeah, I'm struggling to find the question here. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> right, so basically does light curve and Doppler shift measurements, could you entangle to get both together to, you know, be able to extract the fraction of spot to faculty coverage. I presume that's the, the idea here. Yeah, yeah, I think the answer is yes, that it can be done. I know that um, the photometric observations and the radial velocity observations are studying kind of different things, unless you're considering chromospheric emission lines that might be observed in your radial velocity observations, for example. And so there's some really neat work being done by people who study, for example, the calcium H and K lines that are often tangentially observed during radial velocity observations, which we could use to try to decorrelate the stellar activity signals uh, from the radial velocity signals that the planet might be buried in. You could imagine that something similar could be done, and this is something that I'm actually actively working on, uh, to create proxies for the photometric activity that you would expect to see based on the chromospheric activity you do see in spectroscopic observations. And so you could use one to predict the other when you only have one of the two. Um, so I, I think the answer to this question is yes, that it is possible, if not already being done by some clever folks, uh, to infer both the spot coverage and the facular coverage, given both spectroscopic and photometric observations. Right. Thanks. And there's, um, I think it's a comment, but it leads to a question. 
uh, which is it's anonymous, and it says uh, the sun can be spotless. Is this a reason to celebrate? And I presume that you know the real question would be something like you know how common, you know, if this spotless sun is a common thing in in our galaxy or among exoplanet host stars, perhaps. So this might be a topic covered by Matthias, so I don't want to infringe too much on that talk. Um, but I will say that the sun on occasion is spotless. That is absolutely true. And the occasions can actually last months, which is fantastic. But uh, we can't guarantee that when we have a short window of James Webb time, for example, that that short window of James Webb time is going to be during a solar minimum on the star that we're talking about. Uh, so we can't afford to hope. We, we really need to be ready, I think is the, the short answer. I agree with that. All right, uh, thank you very much, Fred, for this um, and for the whole overview of, of Subgroup 3.